I love what I do. Photography has taken me to some amazing places. Now is the time to give back to a planet that has given me so much. Well, I'm going to get started today, and I want to thank you all very much for taking the time to join me. My name is Derek Nielsen. I am a wildlife photographer. Many of you may have seen me running around the building. I also do personal training for a few clients in the building. In these photographs, I'm 27 years old. I just left college, or a few years out of college, and at this point, I feel like I have it all figured out. I was living with my girlfriend. We just moved in together. I convinced her parents of that. And not long after moving in, we decided that we were going to travel for six months in South America, give it all up, leave our careers that I had worked so hard in college to do, that she had worked so hard to do, gave up our apartment, and we did. We left and we went to South America with nothing but a backpack. And I had it all figured out, let me tell you. It only took three weeks for me to end up on the side of the road in the middle of the night, ditched by a bus who told me I was on the wrong bus. I had it all figured out. <laughs> and this is a true story. I, my wife and I were in a small town called Pichulima. We were making our way down to Puerto Varas. And Puerto Varas is a, another town further south along the drive. And our bus was coming in 11.55 p.m. Well, when the bus showed up at 11.55 p.m., nobody told me that it was the bus that was running late from an earlier time. And so I got on the bus. The person took my ticket and they said, welcome. And she was dealing with a little bit of a stomach bug, so she wasn't feeling great. And so I quickly was on the bus and we laid down, settled. And some about an hour and a half into the bus ride, the person came around to check the tickets, tapped me on my shoulder, I woke up, handed my ticket, and her eyes lit up. I was on the wrong bus. I, it was heading the exact same place that I was going, so I didn't see the harm in being on this bus. <laughs> but however, they told me that I had to get off this bus in what would kind of be like the middle of Iowa. There's nothing around. I barely speak the language, even though I thought I did. Uh, Chilean Spanish is very different than the Spanish they teach you in high school. So sure enough, my wife and I, we get off the bus, and we're sitting there, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and the person said, well, just flag the next bus that comes down. I promise there's going to be another one coming. Sure. <laughs> I had a tent, thankfully, and if worse comes to worse, I was planning on camping in a farmer's field that night and hitchhiking back into the next town with who knows how far along that was. But I had it all figured out. <laughs> it ended up being that the next bus came about a half hour later, saved the day, and we went on to have one of the most fantastic, fabulous trips of our lifetime. And it started a passion for travel, and it started a love for photography. The more places I traveled, the more I, I realized that I had to keep seeing the next place and the next place. People would tell me, oh, you haven't been here. Put it on the list. I was talking to people earlier. Put it on the list. India, put it on the list. And as I worked my way around, I also started to realize that the places that I were visiting were in deep trouble. Patagonian mountains, the glaciers were receding. In Iceland, the glaciers were receding, the forests were being deforested, droughts were lasting longer. And so I started to shift my travel based out of pure joy into traveling to places that needed to have attention raised for their causes. And that is where I found an intersection of the photography and the skills that I was building as an artist and falling into my other love, which is saving this planet, which I didn't really, I was always into nature, but it wasn't something that I was really, really passionate about. But I quickly became passionate about it. And as I traveled along to these destinations, I realized that I wasn't giving back. I was only taking. I was visiting, I was taking photographs. Sure, I was spending my tourist dollar, but I wasn't doing anything else to help them in their fight. I wasn't volunteering. I wasn't getting involved in the, in the conservation. Um, and so I had to think to myself, how can I creatively give back to these places? And I thought to myself, well, the world doesn't need another environmental organization. Trust me, there's a ton out there. 
What the world needs is someone like myself to help them raise money, get funding, support those organizations that are out there. A lot of them have been established for a long time, the ones we were familiar with, World Wildlife Fund, uh, the Conservation Alliance. And so I started thinking of all the places that I had traveled to. I started doing research what organizations were worthy of, of teaming up with or which would allow me to team up with them. And so I handpicked a, a small group from all the places I was going to. They happened to be just over seven because I've been to seven continents now. And I donate at least 10% of my sales to these environmental organizations. Uh, so each of these prints, when I, when I sell them, if not at an auction for full donation, I will donate 10% of all my sales back to environmental organizations that are in the places doing the work. So I'm having an, an, a fundraiser in, in November, and so I just so happen to have these on hand. That's why I have them here. But my work in East Africa and in all of Africa, actually, goes to help benefit Dr. Gabby Wild because she's doing, she's a wildlife veterinarian in Africa, saving African animals. And that just makes sense, a direct connection. I'm not selling photos of Chicago to help some wildlife veterinarian in Africa. That wouldn't apply to my, that wouldn't resonate with my collectors. But knowing that when people buy a print of mine that it goes to help an organization in the place that's doing the hard work, it made sense. So that's how I formed Derek Nielsen Photography. But who is Derek Nielsen? I grew up 45 minutes northwest of the city of Chicago in a small town called Gilberts, Illinois. At the time, it only had, when I was growing up, there was only about 100 to 200 people. And it was basically what I thought was the edge of civilization. <laughs> Farm fields, and behind me, when I was growing up, there was a forest and a swamp. And I didn't have a ton of friends just because there weren't a lot of people living there. So, the friends that I did have, if they couldn't play, I had to entertain myself. So I'd go behind my house and play in the swamp, catch frogs, chase snakes. My mother loved that, mm -hmm. bringing those home. And that was just a way, it was my way of life. I, I fell deeply in love with nature. It was a friend of mine early on. And this, my mother brought me this letter uh, last, last year. It was something I had written when I was about 10 years old. And it says, how can I make the world a better place? I would stop the rainforest getting chopped down I would save all the animals from getting killed for fun. I would stop the gangs from killing people, and I would talk to the president to help people. So I, I clearly, at an early age, had a passion for wanting to give back and wanting to help. And I knew that, I didn't know then, but I knew that I wanted to be involved in uh, saving wildlife early on. So where it's taken me now, I've been to all seven continents. It started with that dramatic trip down in South America where I convinced my girlfriend and her family to let me take her down there for six months. And then it's just gone around the planet chasing these causes and things that I've, I've done my research and finding out about. Who here's been to a national park? Probably a lot of us, right? How many people have been to a different continent? Yeah. How many people have been to two or three continents? Let's say three, okay? I'm going to skip forward. How many people have been to all seven continents? Okay. So I'm finding myself in this rare category of people who've decided to travel to these places. And I don't think it is any sort of elitist thing. It's just, some, it's just a fact. I've, I've seen things with my own eyes. I've spent the money. Um, now that I'm a professional at this, I have people help pay for these trips, which is great. But for a long time, it was basically our travel and our vacation. I would get ideas from, actually she's here today, Betty Phillipsborn and Tom, her husband, had traveled to Borneo and inspired me to go to Borneo. So I researched what was going on in Borneo. And sure enough, they were experiencing some really severe environmental issues. And so I went there and I decided to take some photography. Now, it doesn't resonate with people well to just go and take pictures of deforestation, poached animals, plastic in the oceans, those sort of things. Like that's, it may even cripple people into inaction because they see that, and they're not gonna hang that on their walls as a piece of art. I mean, some people might, good for them. Maybe some people with the MCA that Ann Kern is familiar with, they, they could see that as some sort of art. Most people don't. I would have to tell a pretty good story for them to hang that on their wall. 
But what does resonate is a really pretty picture of, well, the bees, maybe not them, but definitely the leopard, gorillas, or an elephant. And so I decided, again, that I was going to travel these places taking photographs of really beautiful animals. Recently, my trips have been to East Africa. As you'll see in the brochure, I'm starting a safari company aimed to give back to the locals instead of typically wealthy European and American companies running the operation and not giving back nearly enough to people in Africa. So what does a day in the life of a wildlife photographer look like? And I love saying that. I'm a wildlife photographer. That's a pretty cool profession. It's not easy. I'll tell you that. It, it has taken a lot out of me, but every single bit of it is, has been worth it. When I landed in Kigali on my first time in Africa, our guide took Kelly and me directly to the Genocide Museum because they have a long history. Well, they have a, they had a, 1994, they had a really unfortunate thing. I'm sure most of you know they had a bad genocide, but it's still the people who are living there today, it's still fresh to them and they want outsiders to see that. So they took me directly there. On my second trip, just this April, my driver picked me up, took me right to the Genocide Museum. Pretty heavy entrance into a country. After the museum, they took me out back and there was, an, there was a, a few pins that had exotic animals inside. They were just snakes. And I looked at my guy and I said, well, where are these from? And he said, don't worry, they're in the jungle. The next day I was headed directly into the jungle. <laughs> I said, what's that? That's a black mamba, don't worry about it. What's that? King Cobra and that, Puff Adler. I said, what happens if one of those bites me? You're going to die. There's, there's no anti-venom for some of it. And if you can find a hospital, hopefully they get you there in time. Uh, they may be able to save you or save your leg or whatever they, it bit. So the next morning, alarm clock goes off 3 a.m. I'm hopping on this Jeep and into the bush we go. And I'm expecting to be in deep forest, but what I notice is that Rwanda has been cultivated and turned into tea plantations. A lot of the country, it's one of the most dense populated country, or countries in Africa, and its land resources are being consumed relatively quickly, and most of it is for tea plantations from the European and Asian markets. A lot of these tea plantations are owned by Asian companies in China. But after I got through the the tea plantations had started to open up into forests that were still remaining. And then I, I found myself at the foot of the National Park, which is where the chimpanzees were going to be that I, I paid to go see and, and track and photograph and, and tell their story. Well, by 7 a.m. it was already 90 degrees and the humidity level was some of the hottest humidity I've ever felt in my life. And we were going to spend the next seven hours tracking chimpanzees through this, this forest where the snakes were. And we found them. This is, this is actually, I was just recording myself, dripping sweat. My buddy, for some reason, Stephen, who's in the, the books, he was wearing a thick sweater. And I felt so terrible for him. But <laughs> Africans deal with the heat better than, than I do. And we came across this, this group of chimpanzees. In the, it's still early morning in the dense, dark jungle. Light hadn't really made its way into uh, the forest floor yet, and these two chimpanzees took off immediately as soon as they saw us. They don't love humans because we are in direct competition for their natural resources, and we are chopping down their, their homes and planting. And when the chimpanzees run out of food or start to starve, they go back into the villages and steal the food. Of course, the locals don't like that, so they fight. They are, they're making an enemy out of this animal, um, and, the, and the animal doesn't love us now. So it's when they do see you, they take off. Well, I heard them ripping through the jungle, and they were gone. And I had already tracked an hour and a half through this hot stuff. I'm dripping sweat, looking like this. A tiny little hangover, because I was celebrating my friend's 30th birthday the night before as well. <laughs> and... The ranger looked at me and said, well, we'll go find them. Okay. Four more hours of trekking through up and down, up and down. Dense, muddy jungle full of these friendly snakes. And we eventually came across this, this pair that were up in the canopy. And I had a 100 to 500 millimeter 
telephoto lens and I could get a nice photograph of them. I was ecstatic with the work. I went through a quick mental checklist, which any good wildlife photographer needs to do, to not walk away from that experience with nothing but blurry photographs. It's happened to me. I've learned quickly to do that mental checklist. <laughs> Moved my camera. Then I snap these photographs, look at it, I'm very satisfied, and down the tree they go and off. Now, if that was my only encounter with them, I would have been thrilled because I know that in wildlife photography, there are no guarantees. They, animals don't, especially wild animals, they don't pose for you. They do their thing and these didn't like us and so they're off. Well, the guide said he's, they're gonna go meet up with the rest of the group, which isn't too far from here. And so I said, all right, let's go. Why not, I'm here. So off we go trekking for the rest of the family. And as you can see, we did find them and they were absolutely stunning. A primate looks at you a lot different than your dog or cat. The dog or cat will look at you and just say, I love you. I love you. A primate will look at you with, what's your intention? Why are you here? And it's a different, it's a very different connection you make through the lens. And when I'm smart enough to put the camera down every now and again and take in what I'm seeing, it's, it's a really emotionally moving connection, especially with intelligent animals. It's, it's beautiful. So off they go. Again, I'm super thrilled. Meet up with the rest of the group, and we're winding up our, our trip. You only get so much time with these animals to prevent them from overexposure from humans, let them be wild. And so the, the ranger said, finish up, and we'll go. I still had this big lens on. I'm packing it up. I looked to my right, and at that moment I spotted a, a full-grown female chimpanzee as close as Anne and I are to each other right now. And she was just blending in with the darkness of the, the forest floor. And I was so consumed with the ones that I was looking at above that I completely missed her. So I set my camera down and I sat on the ground next to her, this distance, safe distance. And we just gazed into each other's eyes. She was, there was so much nonverbal communication going on between the two of us. There's so much the nonverbal communication that happens with people. But I was doing this with a chimpanzee. It was flat, she was flapping her lips, and the ranger said, she likes you, she's just trying to communicate, there's no harm. I switched my lens at the very last encounter, and I backed up with a, something that was, that could take in the whole scene, and this is her. I'm gonna let you look into her eyes, just as I did that day, just for a moment, and, and feel a bit of the passion that she brings out in me. It's just, this is exactly what I do. This is why I do what I do is for these connections and to tell her story, to come back home and, and tell people that it's worth saving. The things that we do directly impact what's happening abroad, um, our, our choices as consumers. For her, an easy way, and, and a lot of the places that we go, Simply being a tourist is okay. Our money, so when I paid the $700 to go visit her, that supported the rangers, that supported the park staff, and that will tell the economy around it, we need to protect her landscape and her home so that it isn't turned into another tea field. Because I guarantee you, she brings in as much money to that local economy as the tea does. And I know for certain it does in, in Volcanoes National Park where my little gorilla friend is. That's a billion dollar industry based on people, typically Americans and Europeans, going to visit gorillas. And so there's no amount of tea that tiny country can sell that will replace her. So I'm gonna flip through these. I'm not gonna tell you what all these animals are. I'm not gonna tell the stories behind them, but believe me, there are stories tucked into every single one of these images. And there's a lot that goes into finding them and there's a lot that goes into photographing them. So one thing that I try to do as a photographer is create emotion. I think that's really important to do with your audience. To tell scale, to tell a story inside of the photograph itself. As you can see, like I could, I have a, more photos of just giraffes than you can imagine. It's kind of impulsive when you're around them just to photograph them, but then it ends up just being another photograph of a giraffe. There's really nothing special about it. It's just like, that's a giraffe, good, good picture. What I try to do is show that its landscape, give it a, a little bit of its home, let you imagine what it would be like to be there with it and what it's looking out at. The connection between the mother and her baby as they're making their way across the sunset. 
those sort of connections as a photographer are the things that I'm, I'm really honing in on and, and trying to bring to my audience and collectors. What is that? A baby something? What is yeah, it's a baby gorilla, and it, it, it looks that way because it was raining that day, <laughs> and their hair mats up and gets really <laughs> curly and cute. It's adorable. <laughs> The day actually that, that I was going to take that photograph, I was a little bummed out because it was raining and I had to trek up a sloppy mountain and find these little things. When I got there, I realized that I, I did two days back to back. The first day was beautiful and the second day, I realized that I actually struck gold because my photographs were going to be completely different than they were the day before. But yeah, it's, it's just a little baby gorilla who stole my heart. <laughs> and so did this one. So not only do I take photographs of animals, I love doing landscape photography. Landscape photography is it's, its own skill set. I, I enjoy it. I don't enjoy it as much as the animals. I think they are just been my passion my whole life. And I also do photographs of people. People are a completely different skill set. Oftentimes, people think tribes, and some people will think because of their beliefs that if I take a photograph of them, I'm stealing their soul or a part of them. And it's not as easy as, even though it's difficult, a chimpanzee or something. They don't say, hey, you stole my soul, give me the camera, or how dare you take my photograph, or threaten me with physical violence because I took their photograph. I learned on, on this particular trip in July of 2021 a quick lesson in humility when it comes to photographing people. I showed up at the Hadzabi tribe of East Africa. They're a hunter and gatherer nomadic tribe that is still practicing the way of life that we, have, we had done thousands of years ago. They're still practicing that. And they speak in a language that has clicks and tones. It, it, I had to use a translator, and he's actually right here. His name's Alex. He's brilliant. But when I showed up at the tribe, I started taking photographs right away, and I was a disrespectful guest. Imagine somebody coming into your home as a guest and they're snapping pictures at you. Boom, 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 boom. Who is this person? Even though you know they're there to take photographs, come on, at least show a little decency. But I was so excited to be with them that I had the possibility of taking these beautiful photographs that I just started shooting. Well, the response I got was exactly what you'd expect. The men were just like turned away from me. I could see in their eyes a little bit of disgust. And so, ah, I realized what I, the mistake I had made, so I set my camera down and I joined them around the fire. And they were passing around a, a little clay pipe. And I figured, well, I can try that. It can't be too bad. And I asked the guide what is in it, and he said, it's just some brush weed and some homegrown tobacco. Fine. And so I smoked a bit of that and I passed it around the, the, the fire. And instantly I was back in their good graces and I was a part of their group and they were allowing me to participate in whatever they were doing. Well, then, one of their members picked up his bow and arrow and in one foul swoop hit a bird out of the air. I couldn't believe the accuracy. The bird was as big as one of my cups. And he had nailed it and he brought it over to the fire and he threw it in the fire and he sat down next to me. And I'm thinking, he's going to ask me to eat this thing or something about it. Well, sure enough, he takes it out of the fire, he pulls off the head and he offers it to me. And I'm looking at him like, oh my, God, there's no way I'm going to eat this. The things that run into my head, the next Ebola, the next bird flu, the next COVID-19, all the things that you could get from eating bush meat in Central Africa were running through my mind. Not a chance. So I offended him by saying no. He offered me the sacred bird head part, and I was like, ah, I'm not going to do it. So anyway, I said no, and dang it, I'm bound back on the dog list. Well, two seconds later, eh, not two seconds, I mean, two minutes later, the chief of the group, Bird flies by, picks up his bow and arrow, boom, nails it. Walks over, sets it in the fire, sits down next to me. He's looking at me, and I, he's going to ask me to eat this thing. <laughs> so he goes to reach for it, and I tell him, no, 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 no. Let it cook. <laughs> and Alex, through the language, translates, let it cook. And so he smiles and agrees, and at some point I'm like, well, it's as black as it can get. Whatever's in it is hopefully gone. And I, I stand up and I walk away, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And it goes. <laughs> I won't describe the textures, I won't describe the taste. The taste wasn't that bad. But 
what it got me into was th they then allowed me to photograph them because now I don't think many people will go there and eat the bird head. But I did. And because I did, I was able to get some pretty solid portrait work of, of them. They allowed me to be a member of the group of the brother for that hour. And I actually just returned uh, with my family just this, this uh, July, August, August, and was able to take some, some, same, some photographs of the same group and they welcomed me with open arms. I was a, I was a returning friend. And it was, my, my parents were blown away. Wow, it's a tribe from East Africa, the Bushmen, they know you. It's, <laughs> this kid from Gilbert's who was chasing frogs, now has friends in East Africa. The women typically are a little bit more challenging as a man to photograph. They're not as receptive. I'm okay with that, but when I show them photos of their children the year prior, they, they opened up a little bit. They don't, typically don't like to make eye contact with men. Um, even when I'm there in conversation, they avoid it. But. So Borneo, <laughs> that's only one continent. I will go through the other ones a little quicker, but Borneo is a place that is also near and dear to my heart. They are facing one of, it is the largest deforestation process in, on Earth. It's, there's more trees lost in Southeast Asia than there are in the entire Amazon rainforest per year. But it's spread out over islands, so we don't see it that way. Now, if you go to Borneo, the largest island in the world, you can argue if Australia is an island or not, but Borneo, the largest island in the world, they are losing their landscape and, and um, their trees at a rapid pace, and it's all for palm oil, one species of tree. I had to drive four hours to get through acre and mile and mile of palm oil plantations just to find the jungle where these beautiful elephants are living. Uh, this sea turtle was taken off the coast of Borneo uh, and there's islands around the outside, really beautiful, great scuba diving. It's a full, it's a western tarsier, it's a, a nocturnal carnivore eats all sorts of insects and bats and whatever it gets its hands on. But they live in the jungle. These, all these animals are all, it's, it's an incredibly diverse ecosystem that is losing its, its habitat and its palm oil. Palm oil is found in, in most cooking products such as like cookies, uh, oil, like actual cooking oil itself. It is found in soaps, it's found in detergents, it's found in a lot of things. If you check your labels, you will see that there is palm oil in a lot of things, and, and most of it comes from in Southeast Asia, and it is making its way into Central and South America, and for the first time, it is making its way into the Congo, because that's actually where it's from, is the Congo. Uh, the organizations and the people who have invested in palm oil are now bringing it to the other places that it grows, and it is a huge global problem. Antarctica, to me, is the most beautiful continent on Earth. It is the most beautiful landscape I've ever been to. It is the only landscape that has made me cry just looking at it. The scale of the ice is unimaginable. Nobody prepared me for how big it was. Nobody prepared me for the amount of wildlife that I was going to see. In one trip between two harbors, I saw 50 humpback whales, and it was only a 30-minute trip. Nobody can prepare you for the animals and, the, and the, the ice. There's a picture of a sailboat making its way through. These people are incredibly brave. I was on a much bigger ship. But you can just see how the ice and the mountains dwarf that. That's a pretty decent sized sailboat too. Uh, so I went down there chasing wildlife. I wanted to photograph penguins. I wanted to photograph whales. This is, I was part of a kayaking group. And you could see just how close the humpback whales will come to us, which was Incredible. But as the saying goes, people go down to Antarctica for the wildlife and they return for the ice. It is unworldly. There are so many shades of blue, you can't even count them. And it's, photographing them is a dream. It's, it's a playground. There's so much creative compositions in front of you. This photograph, I will admit, was an accident. <laughs> it's better to be lucky than good sometimes. What you're seeing here, actually, I was camping on the mainland, and I, was, I had my, my tripod set up, and I was, I was 
trying to photograph the iceberg that was coming in. We had a full moon rise the night before, or almost full moon, and I knew the next night that there was going to be a full moon. And so as this was rising, I was playing with compositions and doing things that a normal landscape photographer wouldn't do. I, my settings were quicker, which make for a darker scene. I was just playing with some things. And as I was photographing really quick, this was taken at one one thousandth of a second. A normal landscape photograph would be about, at this time of day with the light, maybe three seconds. If that were the case, what you see here, this humpback whale jumping under the full moon would have never been in the shot. It would have just been a tiny little nothing. But because I had that accidental shutter speed going, playing with some things, the, the whale was captured underneath. And, and then when I got back to shore that, that next day, I wrote my parents a card uh, I was going to be sending out of the, the U.S. port down there. And as I was writing the beautiful things that I had seen, I had tears coming down my face. Just, I was so excited to share that with them. And it was just such an emotionally beautiful scene I could have never imagined, and here I was, and that's why I titled this one The Emotions of Antarctica. A couple of the other places I traveled to were, were in, well, like I said, all seven continents. So it was kind of a bucket list thing to do, just to be able to say a vain thing almost. But I was like, I, mean, I want to go to New Zealand and Australia, so I traveled in New Zealand, and I fell in love with the landscape there. It's not a place that people go typically for wildlife photography, but when I was there, I realized that my expectations were completely blown out of the water and that that landscape is, is so stunning that I would go back there in a heartbeat if anyone would let me. South America is where my photography, travel photography, wildlife photography journey began. Each country in South America has so much to offer. The people are so kind, so beautiful. The landscapes, particularly down in Patagonia, are so untouched. They're so harsh that people don't live down there. It's unforgiving, and the ones that do are really strong and brave. It's an impressive place. I haven't spent as, as much time as I would like to in Europe. The first time I was in Europe, it was a, a trip that I told my wife, we'll go there next because she really wanted to go to Paris, and I convinced her to go to South America for six months, so I felt like it was a really good idea to take her <laughs> to Paris, and so traveled to Paris. Iceland, and to London. All these places, like I said before, uh, they do have their own problems. So I have teamed up with local environmental organizations in, in Iceland. All my uh, work goes to help an organization that is trying to preserve the, the wild spaces around Iceland, even though of all the countries, it's one of the more progressive countries. So they have their acts together when it comes to conservation. And here in the United States, our home, I, during the pandemic, when everything just went awry, I actually decided to sell everything that I own, basically, and move out west. I sold my house, and I was living in Jackson, Wyoming, and doing wildlife photography, and falling deeper in love with the west. I hadn't really spent a lot of time out there photographing it. And so I, I got to understand moose behavior. I researched I, I how to spend time around moose, and just like a lot of the other animals, the predators that I'd spent time around in the past, there's something to look forward to. This moose in particular wasn't too fond of my presence, but what it turned out he wasn't happy was there was another moose, a juvenile behind me that he really wasn't happy about. And so as you can see, the hair standing up on the back, just like a cat would do. When that happens in a moose, it's time to back off. I'm photographing with a 600 millimeter lens and it's about the size of half of this, this desk. And so I was a very safe distance away from that animal and there were, neither of us were in any danger. But when I turned around, I saw the, the little one, and this one gave charge. And when you want to see an eight-foot-tall animal running at full speed, you get out of the way quickly. And thankfully, I was just enough out of the line that he ran right past me and chased off the little juvenile. Each of these have taken in a national park or national forest around the United States. The United States is one of the most beautiful countries in the world when it comes to diversity of ecosystems from north to south, east to west. We do have a lot of treasures here. A photographer could make an entire career out of just photographing the United States, and many have. Again, 600 millimeter lens, <laughs> nice big range, so I'm not getting very close to these animals. And my home, Chicago, and your home right now. I photographed this during the George Floyd riots that we were experiencing, the terrible time in Chicago's history, when the bridges were put up to separate the city. 
there's so much in this photograph for me and for the city when it comes to segregation, when it comes to the times that we were experiencing during them. It was a very divided country, and, and unfortunately, well, it still is in many ways. I have an entire library of Chicago photographs that I, I encourage you to go to my website and check out. I won't show you a lot of photographs of Chicago because you live here, but I encourage you. And if you have any questions about this photograph or any others, please don't hesitate to reach out. These are the organizations that I support globally. Each of them, as I told you before, is a, a, benefit, a beneficiary of at least 10% of my sales, if not 15 or more. And each of them are doing work, important work, in the places that I have photographed. Why do we need it? I read this quote the other day from Barack Obama. I thought it was appropriate. We are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. And I, I truly feel that that is, that is real. The things that I've seen with my own eyes that aren't fake news, that aren't some news media source telling me their narrative, whether it's right wing or left wing, doesn't matter. I've seen these things with my own eyes and I can't unsee them. This is why I do what I do, because the places that I've traveled to are in need of protection. And as I said before, these are all photographs of mine in the photojournalism side of things. Palm oil destruction, overfishing, plastic in the oceans. The one is a stock photo, that's not mine, but you get the point. So instead of showing those as fine art images, I choose to go the other route. I show them as what you see in front of you here and what people can display in their home. To have them fall in love with nature just as I have, to take a little bit of what I see and bring it into their living rooms as a conversation piece and as as some of you, since a lot of you sounds like you've traveled, as a, as a memory of, of a time that you've traveled somewhere that you've been and that resonated strongly with you. And I, I'm sure if you've been to Africa, it, it's still with you. Nature finds its way into all of our hearts. And mine, I was fortunate that it found its way into my heart at a very young age. I have had the privilege of meeting a lot of, of your residents, and I've, I've had the privilege of calling them friends. Uh, John and Ann Kern. Uh, John was a good friend of mine. I worked with John for a long time. Uh, Faye Stern, uh, Paul Gale and Rob Carlson, Susan Haddad, um, Gloria Vaughn, and unfortunately I tried to get Rita Bakewell here. I've, I've learned so much from some of your friends, from your, from your neighbors, and I listen to the things that they tell me and the, the lives that they've lived before me. And one person who was a little bit stubborn was Donald Freebairn. I love Donald Freebairn. He's what, he was one of my favorite clients of all time. Well, Donald Freebairn was not a lover of animals. I brought my dog, Dozy, and if any of you have ever met Dozy, she's the cutest, one of the cutest dogs on earth, and she's a really big sweetheart. Donald wanted nothing to do with her. He was terrified. In the end, of his life, when I would come and visit, I would take Donald out to the ninth floor and we would walk around the garden that was out there. And the one thing that Donald always looked forward to was watching the monarch butterflies attach themselves to the, the milkweed plants. And every day he would ask me, can we go outside and watch the monarch butterflies? I said, sure, Donald. So I know that if, if nature could find its way into Donald Freebairn's heart and he would fall in love with, with nature at the very end of his life, that um, it can find its way in, in all of our hearts. And that is what I do. I'm a wildlife photographer, still trying to figure things out.